Hi, this is Dave with OC Astronomy. I'm going to be presenting you with some material and some short videos that covers the OpenStax Astronomy textbook. That's the book that we're going to be using for our astronomy course here at Oklahoma Christian. If you're not enrolled in the class but you just want to watch the videos, I think it'll total out at about five hours of time. Uh, and feel free to, to watch whatever videos that you like based on the chapter content and you can look up the openstacks.org textbook online and it's free. So let me know if you enjoy the, this series of videos. If you're in my class, I would command you to click that like button. No, not really. Uh, if you want to click the like button, throw me a bone, that's great. And uh, if you hit a dislike though, I will, I will hunt you down. You're standing on a planet, the closest planet to us, uh, the closest planet to yourself is the Earth. Sometimes that comes up as a trick question. What's, your, what's the closest planet to us? And the answer is the Earth, it's the one we're on. Um, it's in the solar system. The other closest object in the solar system to us is the Moon. There's another bright object in the sky that you've probably noticed. It's the large body that creates its own heat and light uh, through electromagnetic radiation and it's the source of all the energy that we have on our planet and we call that the Sun. The Sun is a star and sometimes you get another trick question of what's the closest star to Earth and the answer is the Sun because it's a star. There's some other bright objects that you can see in the sky that move around. Um, we call those planets. This comes from the Greek terms for uh, wandering stars and we've just shortened it to the wanderers which is uh, their word was planetari or planets. Uh, and that comes from the fact that against the background stars, those stars appear to wander. One thing that took observers a very long time to figure out, it also took the invention of better technologies and better equipment, is to determine how far away those bright objects that move around in the sky, how far away are they? At first they were able, even the ancient Greeks were able to determine the distances relative to the Sun-Earth distance and we call that distance an AU, an astronomical unit. They were able to find the distance to the Moon and the distance to the Sun in relation as they moved by just using geometry. Aristarchus of Samos was uh, famous for doing that. However, it took uh, only until a couple of hundred years ago did they figure out that distance in meters or in a distance that we could understand. In fact, it took voyages of some sailors carrying some astronomers to the other side of the world and some uh, expeditions into Siberia and Russia to figure out, as they observed the planet Venus cross in front of the sun, exactly what that distance was. And they had to use some tricky methods uh, called parallax to do it. Um, in fact, on those voyages, uh, some people died trying to figure out that information. So it's been very important through the course of history to figure out what are those objects in the sky? How are they in relation to the Earth? Uh, how far away are they? What are they made of? It's something that humans have been curious about for 20,000 years. Um, one thing they were able to pin down is that the astronomical unit and the distances between the planets is exceedingly large. Even the distance to the moon is very large. And if you have the moon on one side and the earth on the other, if you were to bring all of the other planets and line them up, you could fit every other planet in between the space between the moon and the earth. If you had them all in one long chain, all of our other planets in our solar system could fit in that gap just between the earth and the moon. So if you imagine how far away the other planets are even, the distances are just mind boggling and, and very difficult to comprehend. In fact, the sun itself is so far away that when light leaves it, it takes about eight minutes or so for that light to get here. The nearest star from us is about 3.3 .3 or so light years away, and that means that that light would have to be traveling for three years just to find the nearest star to us. Um, if you see a star that's about 500 light years away, that they've been able to measure that distance away, then you are actually looking at that star as it appeared 500 years ago. And so whenever you look further back in distance, light takes the time to get here and you're actually looking back in time. Uh, and so that, that's one unique thing about the universe we live in. As you study it further and further away, you're watching the development of the universe over time. If you live far from city lights, you can actually see some other bright objects besides stars. You can see the glow of the Milky Way that stretches from south to north 
and uh, passes through the constellations Aquila and Cygnus and Cassiopeia. You can also see three or four other galaxies out there. Uh, you can see the small and large Magellanic clouds. Uh, they're very close to the Milky Way. You might consider those to be dwarf galaxies. Then there's another galaxy called the Andromeda Galaxy, and um, it's about 2.5 million light years away. And there's another galaxy called the Triangulum Galaxy that's about 2.7 million light years away. Those that we can see, and then plus a few others uh, that you can see with binoculars, form our local group of galaxies and we're all they call it the local group because we seem to be interacting together with gravity and we seem to be moving around the universe in a clump um, a larger clump that contains the local group is called the supercluster the virgo supercluster the virgo supercluster contains uh, many hundreds of galaxies and if you look towards the constellation Virgo, you see quite a lot of galaxies all clumped together in one, one place, and we're actually part of that same group. If you start to look even broader in the universe, you'll see um, that the, the clusters of galaxies tend to form walls and chains, and it almost looks like uh, the outside skin of a bubble, and, and then in between those clusters, there are voids in space which are mostly empty. But the structure of the things that you can see, the bright lights, they tend to form chains and walls. It's kind of like a, uh, a very, very airy Swiss cheese or a very well-made and delicious, the inside of a French baguette, the way that the bread bubbles up. Um, you, can, you can kind of also picture a clump of soap bubbles. And so you have the structure contains the galaxies and then there's basically emptiness in between those. That carries out as far as we can see in one direction and as far as we can see in the other direction. Uh, everywhere that we look is that same similar structure and uh, all the way to the farthest that we can look, we expect that to be about 13.74 billion light years in one direction or the other um, because we estimate that that's about the age of our universe and so we'd only be able to see the light that's been traveling towards us since the beginning of the universe and has had that amount of time to reach us. And so that's about 13.74 billion years, according to the model that we have. Now from the largest thing that you can think of, let's go all the way back down and look at the smallest thing you can think of. The smallest piece of something that retains its character and its, initial, and its inherent properties, you would call that an atom. Uh, if you have a bunch of those same atoms together, you would call that an element, uh, or you have a, enough of it to look at, and it's the elemental form of that material. You, you call it an element, even though if you have a clump of it, it might have some impurities in there, but theoretically you could separate out those impurities, and so that would just be an element. If you have, though, physically and chemically bonded those uh, any two atoms together, uh, they're usually uh, they're bound by electric forces. Those are called molecules. You can have a molecule of the same kind of atom or of different kinds of atom, but two or more that are inseparable, uh, you would call those a molecule. There may be something even smaller than the atom, but once you break it down past that, you lose its inherent properties. You have uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, neutrinos, you have these smaller pieces of things, uh, and if you look even smaller than that, you have up and down quarks. In fact, up and down quarks, neutrinos, and electrons are kind of the particles of, our, of the model that we, that we know that's, that's most familiar. There's also another model that suggests even inside that, you have something called a string, and a string would be the fundamental building block of everything, um, but that, those piece parts lose their inherent uh, aspects of what you would consider to be a, an atom or an element. So using the properties of these elements and what we can do is examine them in the lab, we can determine some very interesting properties that have to do with the light that's emitted by these elements and molecules. And then looking at that light in a lab, you can look out into the universe and we have seen that out of the universe, the light that's coming to us is the same as the light that we can make these elements emit and these molecules emit. And so we can actually look at the light itself at a distance and find out the chemicals and atoms 
that uh, the rest of the entire universe is made of based on its properties. And we've used those properties to build up some math models uh, of what we, what we expect uh, is how the universe behaves. Now, the universe, as astronomers call it, is just out to the visible edge of what we expect to be able to see. And uh, our current model says the entire universe, uh, it goes back to 13.74 billion years. And what I've just described is a mathematical model or theory, and this is important to learn in, your, in this science class, especially this introduction. What is a, a model and a theory? Well, first, you come with, up with an observation. An observation is just something you see or something you notice. Uh, back in the old days, it was just that some things fall down and other things rise up. And it has to, so they thought it had to do with buoyancy or the lightness of the object. But then Galileo started throwing balls around and he noticed that the ball always travels in a certain shape if you throw it. He did some mathematical observations and refined it and came up with an empirical law or an equation to describe what's happening. And we call that now a parabola. But based on that equation, you can put some inputs into it like the, the mass of the ball or how hard you throw it or what angle you throw it at. And you can predict to a pretty large degree where that ball is going to land once you release it. Um, and so those are laws of physics and laws that, that we've come up with. And uh, they're usually expressed in mathematical form. So you almost have to learn a little bit of math to be able to converse with people to talk about these, these fundamental laws. Now, after you've made the observation and you've put down what you think is a law in mathematical form, you might want to investigate why that happens. And that's when you get into the realm of something called a theory. Now, you can come up with a hypothesis, and a hypothesis is just a statement that says how you think things operate. And then you can do something called an experiment. An experiment is a controlled observation where you limit a lot of the variables and you just get it down to the part that you're interested in in your hypothesis and you just want to observe that part of it and reduce all of the other outlying figures. For instance, if you were doing some uh, research like Galileo and you wanted to research a ball in flight, you probably wouldn't want to use the ball thrown by a Major League Baseball pitcher if he throws a curveball. Because what he's doing is he's throwing the ball, but he's also spinning the ball using his hand and the, and the whip that he gets. And that ball is spinning as it travels through its arc. So it behaves in a different way. And you can have balls that appear to rise based on air resistance. You can have curve balls. And so if you were doing an experiment on the motion of a ball to determine it, its uh, effect under gravity, you wouldn't want a, a slider or a, or a curve ball being thrown. It would literally throw your experiment on a curve ball. You would uh, want a cleanly thrown ball with as normal a spin as possible to get there. Uh, and if you could actually remove the air in a chamber and throw it, even better because you've eliminated one variable. So based on eliminating uh, unknowns, you can get to the core behavior of something um, and see if it fits your hypothesis. The more that you can eliminate and isolate, the better your experiment will be in defining the characteristics. And then you can add complications onto that like air resistance and you can come up with another hypothesis of how air interacts with the ball that is thrown. Uh, but then that would be expanding on the knowledge of the behavior of that ball being thrown. So lots of people like to say, well, it's only a theory. Well, there's more to it than that. A theory is not just a word tossed about lightly. A theory means that you've built a model, you've used a hypothesis, you've done your experiments, and you've done that enough times to where they're repeatable. And then based on what you've come up with, your law seems to hold. In fact, it seems to make predictions of future behavior. So if you've only watched a ball being thrown at a 45 degree angle and you make a theory about the behavior of that ball and you put it into a mathematical form, then if you were to vary the angle that that ball was thrown, your theory should be able to account for that difference in angle and still predict the location of the ball once it lands. And in that case, you have a working uh, probable theory. Now, if someone were to come along and do the same experiment and get a different result 
or do an experiment from an angle that you hadn't thought of, but that still contains the same variables and that disproves the action that you predicted, then that will disprove your theory. But you shouldn't disprove a theory because you have a difference of opinion with it. In fact, opinion doesn't enter the game at all. If you have a theory, that theory should hold even if only one person shares your opinion and it's you. Like, for instance, Copernicus. Copernicus had a, a better theory for how the Earth and the Sun were in relation to each other. And uh, his theory went against 1,500 years of an established theory by Ptolemy. And Copernicus's idea was that the Earth moved around the Sun. Well, it only took him believing it and printing up his observations and his math and then disseminating that out and let people look at it before they decided with a little bit of refinement that that theory made more sense. And since then, we've been using that model for, our, uh, for how the world works. So the job of an astronomer is to look out into the heavens and maybe with a little help from our friends in the laboratory looking at atoms and the light that they emit and, and uh, we have uh, chemistry and math and other, uh, other sciences that help us out in that regard, they help us determine what's happening with these elements, then we can look out and see the light that's being shown to us from the heavens, compare them, and see how they interact with each other. That's basically what astronomy is all about, and I hope that this has been a good introduction to chapter one. It'll tell you, uh, each video, I'll tell you the title at the front of it and what we're going to cover. I hope to see you back on further videos. I hope you enjoy my semester if you're in my class as a student. Uh, and I look forward to bringing you more from the OpenStax Astronomy Textbook. Thanks.